Thanks to CuriosityStream for keeping Legal Eagle in the air, which now comes with Nebula for free. Get 40% off of both with a documentary distancing discount. Link in the description. Finally, at the end of their rope, the police shoot more gas munitions through every window in the house to flush Secan out. Something has to be done, and fast. What would you do if you lost your home, not because of fire or flood or other horrifying natural disaster? What would you do if your home was taken and destroyed by the very people you trust to protect you? The police in your own community. For most of us, our home is our most valuable possession, not only in terms of monetary value, but also regarding our own personal safety and security. And don't forget about the sentimental bond many of us feel with our homes. We spend most of our time at home, relaxing with loved ones, playing with our kids, and celebrating family occasions. So is it ever okay for the government to just destroy our homes without notice in the name of public good? Imagine that while you're out with your family enjoying a nice day of shopping, the local police blow up your house, reducing your sanctuary to rubble, all in order to catch a felon. Frightening, right? But it can happen. And it did happen to one family in Colorado in 2015. Once the initial shock of the family wore off, they wondered, will the government compensate us for the total destruction of our home? Well, that's the question that we must answer in. The case of the house the police blew up. Submitted for your adjudication. Summertime, 2015. A beautiful cloudless day in Greenwood Village, just south of Denver, Colorado. The happy family of Leo Leck lives an idyllic suburban life in their comfortable 2,000 square foot two-story home. They're a busy working group, Patriarch Leo and his wife, their son John and his young family. The weeks are rushed and seem to fly by, but they get to relax just a little on the weekends. As it is for many Americans, their house is their prized possession. They take great pride in its appearance. And on this particular day, the Lecks are planning a family outing with a home in mind. As luck would have it, the family sets off on a fun day of shopping for the home renovation. They're particularly excited because they've been saving for this home makeover project for more than two years. First, they plan to visit a flooring store to choose some new hardwood floors. Then they're headed to the home center to pick up a few odds and ends. The only one not excited for this big weekend shopping trip is the family's nine-year-old son. He decides to stay back and take care of the Lex two hunting dogs. <coughs> Meanwhile, on the other side of town, another man is planning a very different kind of day. In a local Walmart, the floor manager notices a disheveled customer who doesn't seem to quite fit in, wandering in the electronics department. The customer? One Robert J. Seacat. Seacat thinks no one is looking, and he begins pocketing small electronics and other items from the store. But what he doesn't realize is that his every move is being caught on the store's surveillance cameras. The floor manager quickly calls the police, who arrive just a few minutes later. As the officers make their way into the building, Seacat realizes the jig is up. He hastily ducks behind a display case and bolts for the exit. Luckily for Seacat, he briefly evades the police and escapes from the Walmart property. But without a plan, he just starts running. Of course, the Lex are blissfully unaware of Seacat, the botched robbery, and the harrowing chase unfolding on the other side of town. As they picture pieces of new furniture and other decorative items in their home, the Leck family happily continues discussing furniture options. As they finish shopping, they're looking forward to taking all of their new furnishings to their home in Greenwood Village. But Seacat manages to jump into his beat up old pickup truck and speeds away from Walmart, but he doesn't get very far. The old pickup, which has never been very reliable, quickly stalls. Seacat abandons the vehicle and tries to evade police on foot, frantically scurrying around the neighborhood. While looking for cover, he comes upon the Lex house, where all is peaceful. Lex hurriedly approaches the side of the house, which luckily for him is obscured by trees. So he picks up a rock, takes one deep breath, and breaks the window. Little does he know he has just triggered a silent alarm. Back at the Walmart, one of the witnesses tells the police that Seacat is armed, lending new gravity to the chase. More officers are immediately dispatched to deal with a potentially violent criminal. The Lex, meanwhile, are still completely unaware of the break-in at home and that their house alarm has been triggered. Don't forget, 
Their nine-year-old son is at home alone, but as far as they know, they have no reason to fear for his safety. So the adult family members stop for a quick meal before they head home. But at approximately 2 p.m., the Greenwood Village Police respond to the alarm triggered at the Leck home. Seacat has unlawfully entered in his efforts to flee police. Luckily, the Leck family's boy hears the ruckus in the garage. <gasps> Terrified, the child goes straight to the front door and escapes from the would-be burglar. Fortunately, Seacat's so engrossed in trying to steal one of the family cars from the garage that the boy safely sneaks away. But the dogs the young son stayed home to watch are still in the backyard. After further investigation, the police learn that this would-be shoplifter actually has a record and a history of violence. As an officer cautiously pulls up to the Lex house and lazily exits his squad car, bullets from inside blast through the garage door. One of the bullets pings the police car, missing the officer by inches. That changes everything. If Seacat is willing to open fire on the police, what else is he capable of? The police begin to realize just how dangerous this situation has become. At this point, the Lex still have no idea of the potentially deadly situation unraveling at their home, but it won't be long before they find out their planned renovation is going to be on a scale they never imagined. The cops on the scene immediately report the high-risk situation, requesting backup, an emergency response team, and a crisis negotiations team. Shortly after that call to dispatch, Commander Dustin Varney arrives on the scene and takes command. The situation escalates fast, so Commander Varney finally orders that Leo Leck be contacted with a warning to stay away. The news that his home is the scene of a potentially explosive standoff is a shock to Leo's life. It turns out that Seacat is wanted on several felony warrants and is a known drug dealer. And now, he's in the Lex family house, armed and, as far as the police know, maybe under the influence. Guns and drugs, a combination that makes the response team very nervous. Varney, being the man in charge, starts making decisions. To secure the scene, he has the home surrounded and sets up tactical command posts. Then, Varney directs the crisis negotiations team to take over and try to reason with Seacat. A tall order given Seacat's instability and the acts of violence he's already committed. Still, the negotiators have to try, tipping off a grueling, hours-long negotiation. And as the afternoon wanes and Seacat speaks with negotiators, he keeps hinting that he might surrender voluntarily. He keeps telling the cops things like, I'll come out, but I just want more time. I don't want to hurt anyone, and I'm almost ready to come out. But when Varney gives Seacat one last chance to come out of the Lex home peacefully, he refuses. So the police turn off his cell phone and move on to the next, much more drastic step, a few minutes after 7 p.m. Cold gas munitions are deployed through the first floor window in an effort to smoke Seacat out. But when Seacat remains inside, Varney surmises he must be holed up on the second floor, which means he also has the tactical advantage. If the police go in after him, they could get shot. Varney makes more quick decisions. Something has to be done, and fast. But all this time, the Lex family dogs have been in the backyard. At the sound of the first holes blown into the wall, one of the dogs escapes, while the other pooch is still potentially in harm's way. The Lex notify police that the dogs are there, but the cops assure the Lex family that their pets will be fine. Meanwhile, Varney has to try something else to neutralize Seacat. Still hoping the burglar will tell the police he'll surrender peacefully, Varney decides to send in a robot with a throw phone to open up lines of communication without allowing Seacat to contact any third parties. Of course, after all the gas grenades, it's anybody's guess whether or not Seacat will be willing to cooperate. Getting the throw phone into the house in the first place is hard enough, but the robot has to enter the house to get there. To do so, police decide to literally blow the doors off the Leck house to make way for the robot to get in. They use a Bearcat armored vehicle and explosives to create an entry point for the tactical team and the robot, which they send in with the phone. More than three hours later, at approximately 10.40 p.m., the SWAT team enters the residence on the first floor and attempts to reach the second floor, one calculated move at a time. But Seacat has other plans and, from the second floor, opens fire on them. The team quickly pulls back, exiting the home. Varney is losing patience while the Leck family is being kept at a distance, unable to see the chaos in their own house. Despite the continuous ringing of the throw phone and announcements over the loudspeaker, officers outside can hear Seacat reloading his weapon. Four more hours crawl by, and Seacat never comes out of hiding, nor answers the phone. The exhausting night bleeds into the grim morning. At about 5 a.m., Varney approves the launch of another exploding device, this time aimed at the east side of the garage in an effort to limit Seacat's movements. 
the homeowners still have no clue about what's happening to their own house. Finally, at the end of their rope, the police shoot more gas munitions through every window in the house to flush Secan out. They blow up virtually every door and every window. All the while, they continue attempting to negotiate, but nothing works. Finally, Varney takes out his final steps, measures that will seal the tragic fate of the Lex family house. Varney orders the Bearcat to open up holes in the back of the residence. Varney's exact instructions are, take as much of the building as needed without making the roof fall in. Varney's plan has three goals. One, to locate Seacat within the home. Two, to prevent him from being able to ambush officers sent in after him. And three, to create gun ports so snipers could, if necessary, shoot into the residence from a distance. And so, the police remotely control the Bearcat and begin bulldozing the house. Piece by piece, wall by wall, they start to demolish the walls, tear down the doors, and open up sight lines. The Lex are about to get that open concept house they'd always wanted. With the destruction complete, Varney orders a tactical team to arrest Seacat by all means necessary. The SWAT team rams through the shell of the house, runs up the stairs, and bursts through a bedroom door to find Seacat with a loaded Glock 9mm handgun. But they tackle him to the ground and disarm him safely. Finally, the police take him into custody. Following his arrest, officers located several baggies of heroin and methamphetamine. The police actions throughout that fateful day are designed to preserve life, and in that respect, they're successful. No citizen, law enforcement officer, or Seacat himself is seriously injured or killed as a result of the incident. Oh, and the pups are okay. Shaken, dirty, but alive. As for the Leck House, well, that's a different story. By the end of the incident, the Leck House looks like it was bombed. Giant holes riddle the outside of the Leck House, including the burst frames of nearly every window and doorway. The interior of the house is a swamp of debris from the battering rams and explosives. In fact, inspectors declare that the Leck home is uninhabitable and a danger to anyone who enters. However, after the shocking incident concludes, the police contact John Leck to let him know that he and his family can return to their home to pick up some of their belongings. The officer also mentions that there was, and I quote, some damage to the house. The Lex later described the scene as a war zone. When the Lex arrived to the disaster area that was once their lovely family home, their reaction is beyond distressed. Their hearts sink. The scene is so bad that there aren't even any personal belongings to pick up. They've all been destroyed. And despite the fact that the police told the family they could return to their property, when they try to enter the home, they are, unbelievably, threatened with arrest. The city of Greenwood Village has condemned the residents as completely uninhabitable and too dangerous for entry. So now what? Where can they go? The Lex aren't millionaires, they have one house. Their most prized possession, which has barely been left standing. So the Lex appeal to the police for help, as they have nowhere to go, no clothes, no personal items, and no home to sleep in that night. In response, the police offer the family exactly $5,000. According to the police, five grand should cover everything, including their insurance deductible. But while the police are confident that the $5,000 will cover a few weeks worth of needs for the adults, the boy and two dogs who have nothing, need food, shelter, transportation, clothing, and all the other normal items of daily activities, the reality is much different. And although the city assists the Lex with temporary living expenses in a gesture of good faith, no further crisis aid or help finding new housing is offered. Moreover, the police deny any wrongdoing, liability, or responsibility for the Lex damages. The Lex home has to be demolished and rebuilt because it's declared a total loss. Sadly, the house is torn down. And what's even worse for the Lex is that a precious heirloom ring, one that survived World War II in Italy, is never recovered from the house. And the young son has to move to another school because the temporary housing they have is out of his district. Meanwhile, the poor dogs are shaken to the core, in addition to being covered in tear gas and explosive residue. So the traumatized pups are forced to undergo medical exams, deep cleaning, and a hair shaving. On the brighter side, a dangerous criminal, Robert Seacat, is in jail and no longer a threat to society. He's convicted of nine counts of attempt to commit manslaughter with a deadly weapon against a peace officer, two counts of attempt to commit manslaughter with a deadly weapon, and several other felonies. He's sentenced to decades in prison. Even so, the Leck family suffers emotional pain and a severe disruption to their lives as a result of the sudden and disastrous loss of their home. 
The days and weeks that follow are daunting and stressful, especially for parents trying to provide a young child with physical and emotional security. Still, neither the police nor the village offers further support of any kind beyond the insufficient $5,000. Enraged by the entire incident and the damage that's been done to their family, along with the pathetic handling of the matter by police in the city of Greenwood Village, the family decides to hire a lawyer and sue. Miss Rachel Maxim and her team of attorneys take the case. The city and police department are promptly served with a summons and complaint, leading them to immediately engage counsel of their own. The police chief, Commander Varney, and all of the other police officers involved in the incident are named as defendants. So the proceedings begin. It's a contentious fight with the tensions running high. The Lex file a complaint alleging a violation of the US Constitution's taking clause. The takings clause of the Fifth Amendment requires the government to pay just compensation to property owners any time their land or other property is, quote, taken by the state. In other words, their lawsuit claims that since the government entity took their home away from them, it was a matter of eminent domain which requires the city to pay compensation for the entire property loss. The city and the police, however, argue that there's a distinction between a regulatory taking, where the government restricts your property owner's ability to use their land by process of eminent domain, and the state's use of police power to protect the public. At trial, the Lex lose on summary judgment, which means that even if the court assumes all of their facts to be true, it doesn't amount to a recognized legal claim. Therefore, the case is dismissed summarily without a full trial. In response, the Lex fight back and take the case all the way up to the appellate court, the 10th Circuit, which hears the case in the winter of 2018. Will the appellate judges see the case differently than the trial judge? Let's take a listen to the legal arguments from both sides. Good afternoon, counselors. So I have here that this case is before the court on the issue of whether the defendant's complete destruction of the plaintiff's home and property is legally actionable. Counselors, please state your names for the record and confirm that you're in agreement that the issue is just as I have stated. Thank you, Justice. Rachel Maxim for the plaintiff appellants, and yes, that is the correct issue. Andrew Nathan on behalf of the defendant's appellees, and we also agree with that statement of the issue. Wonderful. Then, Ms. Maxim, please proceed. Thank you. Simply put, the Lex are seeking deserved compensation for the loss of their entire home. The police destroyed their house for no good reason. Yes, a felon must be captured, but not by blowing up innocent citizens' homes. It's patently unjust. Thus, the defendants must provide fair compensation to the Leck family. May I give a brief response to counsel's opening submission? All right, but keep it short. This case goes beyond mere arguments to appeal to emotions. We have laws to consider, to uphold. In this case, the police and state needed their rightful immunity from prosecution to be able to do the very job of capturing a man who posed a danger to society. Well, then let's get on to the applicable law, the written briefs focus on the Constitution's Fifth Amendment's takings clause. So let's hear your oral arguments on that, Ms. Maxim. Justices, we submit that the trial court erred in its interpretation of the takings clause. The doctrine of eminent domain for which the takings clause stands applies to the Lex's case because their home was, in effect, taken by a governmental entity without their consent. Thus, the defendants must provide just compensation to the Lex. But the trial court found that eminent domain only applies when the government takes legal title and ownership of a private citizen's real property. How was it mistaken on that finding? because the court arbitrarily drew a hard line between the government's power of eminent domain and a state's police power. But there was no statutory or case law to support such a distinction. So tell us what you think is the law on the difference between state's police power and the power of eminent domain, if you find any difference at all. I submit that the law permits application of logic and common sense, and that means the courts must look at the ultimate predicament into which the Lex were put in order to decide whether the preposterous acts and massive destruction done by the defendants are a taking. So are you saying that the purpose of the taking is what makes the takings clause apply and not the definition of taking itself? Exactly. Just as the U.S. Army could take over an entire neighborhood of homes because that spot is needed for strategic missile placement in order to defend national security, the Lexus home was taken over as the place where the police needed to catch a dangerous criminal in the interest of local security. What do you have to say about that argument, Mr. Nathan? May it please the court. I find it's wholly unsupported by case law. 
Counsel conveniently leaves out the line of cases relied upon by the trial court, which clearly separate eminent domain from police power. Counsel fails to provide any authority that stipulates the circumstances of the taking itself are the controlling factor. We must focus on the legal meaning of taking. If that's the case, how should the court define taking? Simply the way it's defined by law and in layman's English. When something is removed from one person by another and when it's then retained by the second person. Here, the state never retained the property. They only used the Leck home temporarily for the public good. The property has been owned by the Lex since the date of the event. That's nonsense, your honors. We must remember that this was the Lex's home, their residence, the place which provided them shelter. And for a good 19 hours, they were homeless. Homeless is homeless, whether the property was transferred to the police as temporary or permanent owners or not. The Lex were literally prevented from stepping foot back into the home because it was declared unsafe and uninhabitable. If that's not the police taking, I don't know what is. Mr. Nathan, how is this case not one in which the plaintiffs lost use of their home, just like they would if its title were transferred away from them? With all due respect, Justice, it doesn't matter. Why? Because this case involved action by the state's police power. It was not a federal matter of national security or any other power that could lead to a commandeering of a private party's property. The police power comes with its own rules apart from the takings clause. Please explain the main relevant difference for the case at bar. Police power controls the use of property by the owner for the public good, authorizing its regulation and destruction without compensation. On the other hand, eminent domain takes property for the public use and compensation is given for the property taken, damaged, or destroyed. Ms. Maxim, is Mr. Nathan correct that takings under police power do not require compensation to the owner? Yes, Justice, but I submit that counsel is misleading the court. What I mean to say is that this case is not about the difference between eminent domain and the police power. They are different. In this case, the police destroyed the house to protect the public from a dangerous person, benefiting the public. The circumstances that led to the destruction of my client's home fall under the takings clause, which means that they're entitled to compensation for its loss. Please clarify whether you have any legal support for that position, because so far we've only heard your and Mr. Nathan's personal definitions of taking. I'm citing a federal court case from 2017 in which the court clarifies a distinction which is controlling here. That court found that when property is damaged as a result of exercise of police power, it is not a taking for the public use because the property has, and this is the key part, the property has not been altered. Thus, if the property is altered, it logically follows that the damage falls under the takings clause. Thank you, Ms. Maxim. Do you, Mr. Nathan, have any cases you'd like to cite to dispute that argument? Well, all of the cases which I cited in my written brief to the court undermine that argument, but to be specific about the case Ms. Maxim is referring to, that court took the words not been altered to mean its purpose had not been altered. To put it another way, had not been altered meant not been changed in purpose to something other than a private residential home. For example, had not been altered to become a blood drive facility or missile command station. Any rebuttal or closing, Ms. Maxim? You're the appellant. Thank you, Justice. I'd request that the court read the reference case on its own and see for itself what the 2017 court meant by the words. In general, though, this is a case where the police used my client's home to conduct police business. Thus, it was taken out of my client's possession, completely taken away by its total destruction, its purpose altered, and thus having been used in such a way, it by definition falls under the takings clause. And this court should reverse the trial court's dismissal. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you, Ms. Maxim. Court is adjourned. So what are your thoughts? If you were the judge, what would you decide? Should the police have to compensate the homeowner for the total destruction of the property resulting from the police work that necessitated the damage? Pause this video and let me know how you think this should turn out. I'll be right here. Well, the appellate court decided in favor of the police. Thus, it decided that there is not a right to compensation when the damage occurs as a result of the state's police power and that the demise of the Lex home did not amount to a taking. The doctrine of eminent domain did not apply. Insurance paid the Lex $350,000, less than half of what it cost to actually repair the house, and paid nothing for the Lex legal fees. 
but the local government complained that the Lex replaced their house in a way that was much nicer than it was before the police blew it up. So take that as you will. And the Lex have asked the entire 10th Circuit Court of Appeals to reconsider the panel decision. If the 10th Circuit rules against them, the Lex might take their case all the way up to the US Supreme Court. That remains to be seen. Do you think it's worth it for them to try again? Hopefully the Lex will get justice because that's what this channel is all about, but it can be hard to get the word out on YouTube when dealing with sensitive subjects. Because the only thing scarier than getting your house blown up by the police is getting demonetized. Which is why my creator friends and I teamed up to build our own platform where creators don't need to worry about demonetization or the dreaded algorithm. It's called Nebula and we're thrilled to be partnering with CuriosityStream. Nebula is a place where creators can do what they do best, create. It's a place where we can both house our content ad-free and also experiment with original content and new series that probably wouldn't work on YouTube. In fact, if you like this episode of The Case Of, you can find an extended version that I actually can't show on YouTube. It's Legal Eagle, now with 10% more explosions. Nebula features a lot of YouTube's top educational-ish creators like Thomas Frank, Patrick Willems, Real Engineering, Tirzu, and tons of others. We also get to collaborate in ways that wouldn't work on YouTube, like Tom Scott's amazing game show Money, where he pits a bunch of famous YouTubers against each other in psychological experiments where they can work together or profit individually. It is so, so good. So what does this have to do with CuriosityStream? Well, as the go-to source for the best documentaries on the internet, they love educational content and educational creators. And we worked out a deal where if you sign up for CuriosityStream with a link in the description, not only will you get a one month free trial for CuriosityStream, you'll also get a Nebula subscription for free. And to be clear, that Nebula subscription is not a trial. It's free for as long as you are a CuriosityStream member. And for a limited time, CuriosityStream is offering their documentary distancing discount, which gives you 40% off of their annual annual plans and gift cards so you can stay in and stay curious. That's $12 a year for both CuriosityStream and Nebula. I mean, since we've got to stay inside anyway, we might as well be soothed by the voice of David Attenborough narrating tales about tiny hummingbirds or join astronaut Chris Hadfield on a road trip through the universe or watch Tom Scott torture your favorite YouTubers. So if you click on the link in the description, you'll get both CuriosityStream and Nebula for 40% off, or you can go straight to curiositystream.com slash legal eagle. It's a great way to support this channel and educational content directly for just $12 per year. Just click on the link in the description or again, go to curiositystream.com slash legal eagle. Clicking on the link in the description really helps out this channel. So how would you have decided the case of the house the police blew up? Leave your objections in the comments and check out this playlist over here with all of my other true crime videos. So just click on this video and I'll see you in court.